And so I just want to thank you for joining us tonight. It's, uh, it's really exciting to have Monica with us tonight. She's just a fabulous artist and a wonderful person. Um, and so with the Monmouth Museum, uh, it's if you're not familiar, which I think everybody on here is, but we're a 15,000 square foot museum with two galleries and two children's wings. I'm the executive director, I'm Erica Hellstrom. And uh, we're hoping everybody cross your fingers to open in June, the two galleries and the Wonder Wing. So we're, we've been working really hard. Um, the staff is doing whatever they can, Kathy, Todd, Helen, myself, and our board, everybody's just kind of jumped in to uh, save the day. And we hope to see everybody in person really soon. So, um, but we're here tonight with Monica and um, this is uh, to complement her virtual exhibit that we have right now, Cultural Inter Intersection. Monica is a New Jersey based artist, um, also based in Texas where she is now. And she is actually, she has an interesting show coming up too in New Jersey and I have the title written down. So it starts April 30th to September 27th at the Jewish Holocaust Museum in Texas. And it's withstand Latinx art in times of conflict. So uh, lots of good stuff coming from Monica. She has a great book too. We were just mentioning it before. I think Eleanor and, and I were just talking about it. So it's available on Amazon and it's a fabulous read. Um, it, really her images speak with such intense emotion and cultural identity. And it just, it, no matter, even though it's so deeply personal, it just speaks to everyone and it's beautiful. So uh, without taking up any more time, I just wanna pass it on to Monica. Thank you for being with us tonight. Okay, thank you so much for speaking so good about me. <laughs> I hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you, Erica, the Mangan Museum, for giving me this opportunity to share with all of you my artwork. Thank you so much. So aside of that, uh, being in the arts helped me to examine myself, to find my inner voice, and to follow my roots. It's like a constant learning process about myself. Um, yeah. So I'm going to start with three of my paintings that they will give me a quick idea of my background. So you have an understanding of my pieces. The first piece is called Exile. Um, well, this is, there are two sisters being forced to leave from Germany in World War II. One of those sisters is my mother. So this is exile. If we go to the next one, it's called passport. Uh, on the right side is my grandfather. On the left side is my mother. Underneath, it's me. And what it says on top of my grandfather that I wrote something, it says, a 40 generations of German blood, in quotes, wasn't enough to be German. Underneath me, I put my own thoughts. And I said, today, year 2000, I don't belong to any country. I belong to a planet called Earth. And that is the feeling or the res uh, residuals that I got from that exile, my parents going to a new country. I never find my roots, nowhere. So another point in this uh, painting is that if you see in the middle is a passport and it's the passport of my mother. And it has, I don't know how big you can see it, but it has a big J like a stamp in there. And I figured that that J was Jewish and that's it. But I never find it in any other passports coming from Germany. So one day I went to the Holocaust Museum here in Houston, Texas, and I saw under glasses passports and it was one passport with a J. So I called somebody, a 
guidance and I asked him if somebody can explain to me why one passport as DJ and the other doesn't. The incredible thing, and it was a good learning thing, they told me that some people, Jewish people, didn't have the Aryan features. They didn't look Jewish. So for them to make sure that when they look at the passport, they know who they are, they stamp a J. So they are not going to get confused. So maybe we can, did you all listen? Yes. <laughs> You're so quiet. <laughs> yes. So the next piece, it's called Touch by the Pest. When I say touch by the pest, it's not like my parents or my grandparents or I reach to my grand grandparents. It goes deeper than that. It goes to my roots. From where I feel I belong. And I belong to a little pieces from every place. But they some, some of them are very inside me, very go very deep. And this is the way I um, show, I put it, put it that way. Uh, the other thing in this uh, painting, it was that I usually paint very big. And they are very difficult to take to exhibitions. Uh, I have to rent a truck, etc., etc. So I decided to work in smaller um, canvases. And I bought a couple of canvases. I put this one. I started to paint. I loved what I was doing. And I said, I have to find the way of um, to expand it because it wasn't right. And that's what I find. I took a pieces of wood and I start carving and I did an extension of my paintings. They, are, they have a frame now, uh, but not only that, one more thing, they are heavier. So I have to rent a truck. <laughs> uh, the next one is, let me see, Il Riso, the prayer, embroidery. My daughter was in the hospital for two months and I was with her, she lives in Oregon, in Portland. And I was with her for those two months from the morning to the evening. And I, of course, I was praying all the time. But aside of that, I needed to work with my hands. I needed to express what was going inside me. So I took a picture of my grandmother from my father's side and I draw it and pass it into a fabric. And it was easy, light, something I can sit and I can work with my hands and leave it on the side if I have to move around. So I started to embroider something that I never did in my life. I never took a needle, but it was working somehow. It was a prayer, it came out. Uh, I fall in love with doing what I, what I was doing. In the back of the embroidery, it's a silk screen. And my daughter said that as soon as she come out from the hospital and she has a little time, she will do the silk screen. So this is a work in collaboration between mother and mother and daughter. The other thing that I did at this time, at that time, was writing a poem. And I'm going to read it from, from the book. So I'm going to read it first in Spanish and then in English. El rezo. Le recé a mis antepasados y escucharon mi llanto. Les bordé un manto y escucharon mi canto. Es así como nació Ilán, rezando en su cuna, 
bordándole un manto. Su bracito hinchado, su piecito doblado, su ojo golpeado, su aire bloqueado, rezando en su cuna, bordándole un manto. Now I'm going to the English. The prayer. I prayed to my ancestors and they heard my cry. I embroidered a blanket and they heard my song. That's how Ilan was born, praying by his cradle, embroidering him a mantle. His little arm swollen, his little foot crooked, his eye bruised, his breathing blocked, praying by his cradle, embroidering him a blanket. Ilan was born on May 31st, May 31st, 2009, and with him an embroidered mantle, a poem, and a new sculpture. Today, he's 18 months old, a beautiful and completely healthy boy. The answers to my prayers. Today, Ilan is 11 years old. So, if we go to the next one, it's the prayer installation. I went to my native Argentina, where they accepted me for a residency. My project was both a mediation and the repeated atrocities of state terrorism and a prayer for a better future. In the years 1976 to 1983, Argentina was ruled by a military dictatorship. 30,000 people disappeared, 500 children born in captivity, giving, giving them up for adoption, leaving them without a real identity. So what I did is a call to the community to embroider the names of some, of course, of the desaparecidos, the people that disappear. And for to make it more personal, every time they were embroidering the names, I put in a canister the names with a little of their story, like if they were married, where they were working, if they were teachers, if they had family, where, where they picked them up uh, from the military, um, et cetera, et cetera. So each one was taking one of the names from that uh, basket and uh, reading and then embroidering. Um, it was an incredible experience for me. Um, it was unbelievable. <laughs> uh, also, I took a lot of pictures of uh, different um, places and the, the group I was working with. And also I did a small video of the places where they put them in captivity. And that video is going to be showing also in the Houston Holocaust Museum. So this is the prayer there in Argentina. The next piece, it's called The Pope. Uh, this is John Paul II, born in 1920 in Poland, was elected as a Pope in the Vatican, 1978, and died 2005. Um, I, I was very, he was very intelligent and open-minded. I admire him. It was the right person uh, to be in the Vatican. But I also saw from being so incredibly bright how he was declining to the point that he couldn't even put his head 
up. He was always sitting with his head down. So that was really touching me. One day I went to the post office and I asked for a book of stamps. So I was alone there. The guy had time, it looks like, and he asked me which stamps I wanted, if they were uh, about nature, heart, um, flags, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, oh, you also can have about known people, but not living people. They must be dead. Huh, I said, that's a new one for me. I went home. I took one of my small canvases because I was very decided to, to work in small. And I did him in that position. And I frame it as a stem, you know, that white ribbon in the, in the end. And I left it aside. Um, in 2005, April 2nd, 2005, uh, Jan Pauls died. So I wanted, I wanted pictures of him. So I went and bought a newspaper and I saw him, oh, but we can go to the next one. We can go to the, um, to the one, wait a second, the book grieving, that one. I went to buy a newspaper and I saw him laying down. I took a canvas, it looks like a game was small, and um, I started to paint him. And in the back, I put John Paul II grieving his own body. So again, I did my frame in wood and carved and finish it and finish it. Uh, after a couple of months later, I took the John Paul, the stamp, and I um, enlarge, enlarge that one. So these are both, the, both of them are John Paul in this last stage of living, you know. So we can go to the next one that it's called the Book of Life. I went for one year to study with Heim Gross. I don't know if you know him. He's a sculptor, um, excellent teacher, excellent sculptor. And uh, we communicated very well. And he told me, Monica, if one day you're lost, go back to your roots. You will find yourself. And that's what I did in this piece. It's probably 25 years later, uh, three years ago, I did this piece, I was lost. So I went, I lived in Israel for 10 years. So the mix of Middle East, it's, it's incredible. It's, uh, you go to Jerusalem, it's, it's, it's low mining, it's wonderful. And I put different cultures of Middle East. Okay, this is the book, Embroidery. It's that one, that painting that you saw before opened my, a new door for me to continue working. Uh, so I realized with that book, that it's not just the book of life in general, it's my book of life. I find out that I am a narrative painter. So saying that, we can go to the next one, uh, cultural uh, intersections. Okay. On the right, you're going to see also Middle East, and this white square, it's a book and two hands flipping the pages. And underneath is a circle with two lines, they intersect. Cultures intersect. We are not isolated like I am this. 
we are connected. And that's what I wanted to show in this painting. So if we go to the next one, uh, it's 2020. Artists as witness is the last one. Okay, we lived all, all of us, everybody lived this moment. 2020, artists as witness. This was too much for me. It was heartbreaking. Black lives matter, period. Everybody matters. We have to fight against racism. It's so important. We have to fight in, against injustice. It's, it's, we, we can't just shut our mm, voice because if not, we end up like in World War II. Nobody knew anything. Everybody was quiet. We have to be involved in what's going on. And what's going on, it's wrong. We have to fix it. What you see on the top, it's that moment of fight, of screaming, of breaking. Uh, and all this was in the middle of a pandemic. It was heartbreaking. I was exhausted and I still heartbreak. Uh, and what you see in the bottom, if you see, it's a little girl touching a horse. This horse, the difference between this horse and the ones in the back are the ones in the back are in bones. You see the bones, you mm. see the skin, and what, what you see on the bottom, it's somebody surrounding. Surround, when you, you, you ask for mercy, that little girl is touching that horse that it's in full skin. Now, I wanted to express a little bit better with different artists that probably they went through the same thing, or not the same thing, but same moments of fighting or trying to find solutions to problems. Um, and first I thought to do a research, and then I said, no, no research. It has to come from my inside. So the first uh, one that I find was Beethoven and the fifth symphony. And I'm sure you all know how that starts, but just in case if young people don't are so much involved with that, it starts with four notes and they are ta da da dum. So, and that elevates 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, 50 times until it gets to a point where it goes down, down and you need to breathe. He's giving that moment of mercy, peace, you know, find yourself, breathe. And the other one, because I wanted to, which other one touched me too deep to my soul? And that was from Michelangelo La Pietà. And if you look under La Pietà, the trans it's in, in Italian, La Pietà. If you look under the translation, it's pity. I went when I was 19 years old to Rome. I was in the Vatican and I saw this piece. I saw so many pieces of art, but this piece was the one that touched my court, changed my view. Um, it was mercy to the, to the highest level. So with this one, I finish my presentations. But if somebody wants to ask me something, and I know the answer, more than welcome to share it. So just feel free if you wanna unmute yourself, if you have a question for Monica. And um, I'll actually get it started too. I was curious about um, what drives you to choose a medium, 
right? Because I see that you bounce back and forth. You did some embroidery, you do a lot of painting, but then to see the installation too, like what moves you to choose your medium? Well, uh, today, thanks to pressure that I needed to solve problems, I enjoy looking for new, always I'm looking for new elements, something that gives me life and I can incorporate to my art pieces. With this piece, I used only oil. I, I only use oil. If I use, I use no acrylic, no, no um, watercolor, no. It must be oil. Uh, I feel comfortable at me. It's like also sculpting a little bit. You know, it has that thickness and uh, I can go and tap and, and continues working. Um, but in this case, I did only oil because I was in an apartment in Texas. I had no much elements to work on it. It was just oil, oil and canvas. So this is, this is what I could do at that point. But I, I'm not regretting using other elements. I'm satisfied with, uh, with the way it came out. Um, one more thing, if I have to talk about this piece, is you see in the center, a face. That face is me. And the face underneath, the one that's touching the horse, is me too. That face, it's as a young girl. This face is today. And today I can see a horse without the skin. I can see his, his bones. When I was young, I, I wouldn't be able. So one more thing. And uh, mixed media I enjoy. Today I'm working in, um, in a new piece. It's an installation also with um, with mixed media and I, I can't wait to finish it. <laughs> okay, some other question? Monica, I have a question about your process because there are so many layers to your work and the stories that it tells and things that are hidden in there that I find very surprising. Do you know all this going in when you decide to do a piece? Not do you work it all out or it I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't choose the colors. I have a thin idea sometimes of what I want, but it's just as I work, it must to come out. It, I, it, I'm bringing out what it's inside me, basically. Nothing, uh, it's like the same way I, chose uh, Beethoven or Michelangelo. I don't want to uh, see other artists work. I don't want to listen to what they, how they work. Uh, it's okay, it's interesting, but it doesn't apply to me. I, it, we all work differently. Oh, I can see myself bigger. Mm, I don't know if I like it, <laughs> but uh, anyway. Um, it's, it's, it's the way I work. It has to come from the inside. And you could tell because there are, it, there's just so many surprises. You have to look. Right. Yes, Dan? Uh, what's the overall size of 2020? Of the, um, of the- Canvas. The canvas? Yeah. Which just canvas? 2020? Uh, 2020. I think it's 60 by 48. Okay, thanks. Because I feel comfortable. That's the size I feel comfortable. So I'm pretty sure. I, I have a question. Yeah. C can you hear me? Yeah, but who is it? Lenora. Oh, okay. Okay. Hi. Your work 
is so strong and powerful. The narrative is so strong and powerful, but the work is so soft and accessible. And I just wonder what your thinking is when you're inviting somebody into this powerful narrative, but yet you're, you're doing it with so very welcoming. And especially when you're mixing the mediums, it's, it's that very lyrical, you know, sort of interaction that kind of takes your attention away from like the, also the power of the narrative. Like, I just, I just would like to hear you talk about that a little bit. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, I actually, I didn't, I invite people to my home from the Mammoth Museum, I, again, I'm sure you remember. And I give them a tour into my studio in New Jersey. Uh, and when people come, they always ask me, yes, and I don't want to overwhelm them. So I usually, uh, show them um, two, three paintings and uh, in, in my studio or what I have around in, in my house hanging. Um, if I ask them if they want to see something that, you know, they want to choose in my studio, I have 200 piece paintings or artwork. And they usually pick one and, uh, and yeah, I'm trying to, to always, how do you say, share my, my life, put it that way, with them. If they are interested, I'm not pushing, nothing. <laughs> Monica, you. You, you spoke about feeling rootless when you were very young, going from one country to another. Yeah. Have you found your roots? Are you feeling rooted now? <sighs> it's difficult to say that. When I'm in my home, is it here or is it in New Jersey or is it in wherever it is, I feel like I'm home, I'm fine. But I can travel, move around and I, I'm, I'm, it's difficult to say. I think it's part of that feeling, as I said before, it's my parents needed, needed to leave Germany and they were so hurt that it was, if I have to think, probably I don't want to put roots into any place just in case. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you will not. What I think is we all go through, you know, if you think you, you know, my roots are inside me, but you have them too. Mm. So it's not just me. Right. Okay. Hi, Omi. Who is it? It's Zev. Zevi, where are you? I can see you. It is a my grandchild from Portland. Uh, where is, are oh, you? I don't get it. <laughs> what? Did ask me something? Ask oh, no, I just wanted to say hi. Oh, my God, love you. And see you soon. Okay. See you soon, too. Yeah, this is. That was so sweet. <laughs> okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Monica or her process? I have to say too, you know, um, Monica's book um, is available on Amazon and we're gonna open in June. Um, we, we are just committed to it and we will have it in our gift shop as well. But if you do get a chance, I'll actually email it around to everybody because um, the way that you capture memories, your memories in art, it's you're a storyteller through your artwork and it's really beautiful um, so i want everybody to experience it but obviously listening to you too it's wonderful i can wait to be in new jersey and meeting you in person <laughs> i know right <laughs> we're getting closer yeah. i have enjoyed getting to know you so um well thank you monica um uh, do we have any more questions? i see somebody unmuted themselves just before we go I was going to ask if there were other, uh, any other artists in your family. My father. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
My father needed to be a historian, a teacher, for what I, you know, I see. But when you cut somebody's life, he has to start trying to find something to survive. And he, he didn't have the Spanish in his language was German. Uh -huh. So he started to work on copper. And he was working in copper, like repose, I don't know how to say it, but, um, and my mother was selling the art pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think we still have one more question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, hola, Monica Roca. Oh, Roca, que tal? How are you? Thank you. Uh, we're finally meeting for the first time, and it's yes. wonderful seeing your works, uh, very powerful. And I, I think you validate your, your culture and, and express to everyone else. I'm sure everyone has the same sentiments uh, regarding uh, your works because they can identify it, even though you come from a different country, you've experienced different things. And as you were saying, uh, we're all human. So uh, everyone can I identify with your works and you're very rich in your, uh, in your technique and your abilities, uh, very sensitive. Gracias. Thank you, gracias a vos también. Roca. Thank you <laughs> from Monmouth. <laughs> <Have you. laughs> and uh, if you haven't gotten a chance to take a look at the virtual exhibit, it's online on our website at monmouthmuseum.org. Uh, we will also add to YouTube a video of the artist talk and we will um, overlap, uh, overlay the, the images of the artwork so that it's um, easy to understand and watch as well. And thank you, Monica, so much. I can't wait to meet you in person and to see your work hanging in the Mammoth Museum again. Thank you so much for having me.